Well, good morning, everybody. This is Barry Jones with Standards Plus History Academy. And uh, we are continuing with our examination of the fifth investigation into the, uh, not specifically all six investigations are related to the JFK assassination, but they, uh, certainly some of them are, and all of them peripherally contribute new information, new knowledge, new evidence to the JFK assassination orbit. And so we are on investigation number five. We started with the Warren Commission in 64. Late 60s was the Shaw trial in New Orleans. 72 uh, to four was the Watergate scandal. 75 with the church hearings. And now we are in 76, 77, 78 with the House Select Committee. Yesterday, we learned that the House Select Committee, well, there was pressure applied by Congressman, by Coretta Scott King, by uh, the <clears throat> American population in general, which did not believe the Warren Commission anymore, never did, really. And as a result of what we had learned from those prior four investigations, it was pretty apparent of course, Richard Schweiker even put it in a report after the church hearings that Warren Commission got it wrong, primarily because the intelligence community had withheld evidence from them, and uh, we need to get it right. So they put together this House Select Committee and immediately ran into turbulence because the two people in charge of it, Thomas Downing, Congressman Downing, and also uh, Sprague, Richard Sprague, whom he had chosen as his lead counsel, had made their intentions clear. They were starting with the CIA. They were going to investigate the Mexico City story, and they were going to accept no restrictions on their line of questioning. And, of course, the CIA wasn't used to that. Uh, when the Warren Commission began their inquiry, uh, they had themselves covered the CIA because the guy running it was Alan Dulles, former head of the CIA. So he, he protected the CIA and they had successfully infiltrated and rat fucked the uh, garrison proceedings down in New Orleans. And so they protected the CIA then. Uh, they had through Deep Throat uh, and a, a number of other sources been able to steer the Watergate committee away from any examination of the CIA with respect to Watergate, put all the focus on the White House, so they'd protected the CIA there. Uh, in the church hearings, that was the first time they got exposed, and it was from their own. If you think about it, it was the two CIA directors, Schlesinger, Schlesinger and Colby, who uh, turned over the documents, the family jewels, and boy, what an eye-opening experience that was. And the CIA was, in a lot of ways, laid bare before the American people. And that's why we find ourselves here. And now we're looking back to 63 again into the assassination and 68 with the assassination of Martin Luther King as well. And the CIA knows it's vulnerable. So they cannot abide by Downing and Sprague uh, being continued, uh, uh, being allowed to continue to run this uh, investigation because they will be exposed again. So they went through their, yeah, they they, they had some of their congressmen that uh, they controlled raise issues about money and about the reputation of Sprague or Downing or the called the House Select Committee illegitimate. It was just a power trip. It was, seeking publicity, et cetera, et cetera, stirring up the pot a little bit. And uh, Downey resigned, and in his place steps Gonzalez. Gonzalez fires Sprague. They get in a power struggle. Gonzalez steps down. Stokes takes over, and Sprague resigns. And they replace him with Blakey. And now the CIA is ready to proceed. They have cleansed the power structure of this uh, committee of anyone that might be uh, adversarial to the CIA, somebody who might be a threat, and they replaced him with somebody who 
they kind of made the decision that this is going to be a limited hangout. They're probably, because of new evidence that has emerged, they're probably going to have to admit to a conspiracy, but they want to keep Oswald in the mix, and the conspirators are going to be Cubans and going to be the mafia. can't be the CIA. It can't be anybody government-related. So Blakey's the perfect choice. He's made a whole career going after the mob. So, and since there are mafia uh, ties to the JFK assassination, you're going to make a very, very convenient scapegoat, them and the Cubans. So that's what question we answered yesterday was, uh, the first question anyway was, why does it even matter who runs these things? <laughs> it matters a lot. The second question was, how could two government investigations look at the same set of facts and come to two different conclusions? Well, the first answer is obvious. Uh, they didn't look at the same set of facts. <laughs> the Warren Commission had a lot of facts withheld from it purposely. And uh, they started with a conclusion that was given to them by J. Edgar Hoover. J. Edgar Hoover controlled all the evidence. Alan Dulles protected the CIA, and and the, the conclusion they started with was that Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. That's the conclusion they ended up with. Not a big surprise there. Um, the House Select Committee is, is going into this more open-minded, and uh, there is some new evidence that will emerge, the acoustics evidence with the police microphone, the dicta belt, uh, the brain drawing, the drawing of the brain shows the bullet entering from the front, exiting the back. Um, the time, you know, probably the most significant thing that came out of that dicta belt was not necessarily the number of shots, but the sequence of shots and the time between. And we learned that three of the four shots, of course, they they would, uh, there's some dispute, was it four, was it five, was it 11? Let's just say four. Three of the four shots were, under 2.3 seconds apart so not possible with a bolt action rifle uh so you know this new evidence points to at least two shooters from two locations and certainly two different kinds of bullets frangible full metal jacket so the house select committee as we left off yesterday concludes that it was a conspiracy uh, they don't know the extent they don't know the players but they did name some names at the end. They said, they we suspect the mafia was involved, and they named Carlos Marcello and Santos Traficante. They threw Jimmy Hoffa in the mix. Uh, they didn't include Sam Giancana's name, which is interesting, although Dilly Plaza was just crawling with Chicago mafia. Makes no sense to me. But anyway, uh, and, and then they also include Lee Harvey Oswald in the plot, and they also include the Cubans. And we, we stipulated they were getting close, but they stopped right there because they were prevented. And today we're going to talk about how they were prevented. And obviously the first level of uh, prevention that the CIA exercised was who was going to lead the investigation. We talked about that yesterday with Blakey and uh, getting rid of Sprague. So we want to introduce the saboteur, the saboteur today. We did mention that uh, yesterday there was a uh, an infiltrator who was hired by Blakey, and he did not necessarily sabotage the investigation itself. Uh, he helped with the writing and the crafting of the narrative. His name is Richard Billings. Of course, he and Blakey became friends, wrote a book afterwards, pinned everything on the Cubans, the mafia, and Oswald. Billings was that time life reporter, that Operation Mockingbird guy, captured media. He'd been the CIA's favorite writer for years. And uh, so he got himself uh, ensconced in, within the uh, HSCA and helped write the report. So, but that's kind of the outcome. That's kind of the, at the end result. We want to talk today about what goes on in the investigation, who is sent to infiltrate the investigation so that when the report is written, it's easy to craft a narrative that uh, keeps the CIA's nose clean and the FBI's nose clean. And so we're going to introduce a guy today by the name of George Joannides. One of, uh, somebody commented yesterday, they called him Ratfucker George. Well, this is him. And, of course, we're not going to know the extent and, and really who he was until after he dies. 
And so a lot of this is information that we gleaned later. And this is why Blakey, I mentioned this yesterday, uh, you know, when the report was first issued, and his name was on it, he felt pretty good about it. And uh, and then as time went on and evidence emerged about who this George Joannides was and what his background was, what the CIA had done by putting George Joannides in, inside his organization, Blakey realized he'd been duped. And I'm going to read his full statement today. I want you to see, this is a guy you can clearly see he doesn't pull any punches. I want you to hear his words. I think it's important. Uh, this is the guy charged with the investigate. You only get one bite at this apple. And uh, he went on to have a, a long teaching career. I know uh, he taught at University of Notre Dame Law School afterwards. And he made a career. He, his career is kind of divided into three segments. He's got his uh, prosecutor a prosecutorial career before he becomes involved with the HSCA, which is going after the mob. And then he has his time with the House Select Committee, and then he has his time teaching law to students at Notre Dame. And uh, so he, a lot of what he did in his first two parts of his career became fundamental to what he did in his third part. And he, he talked a lot. And so he was constantly re-examining the House Select Committee and the work that they did because he was teaching this stuff. And as more information came out, time went by, he realized more and more how he got duped. And, you know, it really makes it difficult when you're standing in front of students or maybe giving an interview or whatever, uh, having to defend, defend, defend constantly and realizing there is no defense for what happened. He got you got uh, snookered by the oldest play in the playbook and he's bitter about it. And so his statement, I think is really appropriate here to show a person who, what happens when you get in bed with the CIA and you, you trust them, you, you think they're your partner and then you find out later they weren't, <laughs> they really weren't. Um, a couple documents here uh, on the left, that two page document, is a an example of what a CIA non-disclosure agreement looks like. We're going to go through what these non-disclosures uh, detail and how they really restrict people who have any inside access. And you sign these things, and boy, you, you better hold to them because if not, the agency is going to come after you. And that became a fundamental part of the CIA strategy in uh, preventing any of this new evidence or any of this information that was incriminating to the CIA from getting out, from leaking out. Um, on the right, you see the example of a document after it's been redacted. There's, there, it's the same document. And this is what happens when, when you request through Freedom of Information Act these documents. Uh, and of course, the House Select Committee is going to put in these rules about not releasing any documents for years and years and years and years. I mean, it's like, I think from the, the 2019 or some crazy thing, they finished their work in 78. And, you know, Oliver Stone got that timetable moved up when he added that crawl to the end of his movie, JFK, about how all the documents were being restricted and withheld. And But then when you would do when you would get access to the documents, they would redact it. And you can see how worthless that document ends up being when they take a marker and cross out everything. Okay, there's your document. Have at it. What are you supposed to glean from that? <laughs> it's just like, this is a way that the government, the games that they play to keep information from the people. The bottom picture is George Joannides. And this is, this is going to be uh, an interesting fella. And he's going to be central to our discussion today all right let me move my face out of the way here all right let's talk about these non-disclosures first of all these documents upon concluding their investigation the house select committee refused to publish all the documents obtained during the investigation they they just they uh labeled them classified and they locked them away and 
that was one way to cover up. And I so you know, if you're a JFK researcher, when the House Select Committee finishes its work and you want to check its work, you want to go back and look at their documents and, and uh, you know, further your work as an investigator and a researcher. You can't. There's no documents to look at. And uh, as I mentioned, it's going to be Oliver Stone that puts pressure on them that speeds that up. But even now with the law, they don't release the documents. The last two presidents have been prevailed upon by CIA directors to withhold thousands of documents. So we still don't have them. After all these years, here it is, 2023. Furthermore, the CIA forced all members of the committee, staff members, consultants, and even independent researchers who were brought in to help uh, to sign these, they're called non-disclosure agreements or NDAs. Richard Sprague uh, tells us about these NDAs and how, just how restrictive they are. Quote, first, it binds the signer to never reveal that he is working for the committee. So you don't even know who's, you know, that's, that's, you can't even reveal that you work for the committee. Second, it prevents the signer from ever revealing to anyone in perpetuity, forever, any information he has learned about the committee's work by working for the committee. Okay, so you can't even, you can't reveal that you work for the committee. You can't reveal anything you've learned from working on the committee or with the committee. Third, it gives the committee and the House, even after the committee terminates, so that, that was in 78, the power to take legal action against the signer in a court named by the committee or the house in case the committee believes the signer has violated the agreement. Well, you talk about, you know, an inside job. If for some reason you slip up or some, somehow it gets out, you write a book and you reveal something, uh, you call to testify and you reveal it, whatever they can come after you forever till the day you die. And uh, they get to pick the court. They get to pick the court. And we see in our justice system today how important it is when you cherry pick courts. And, you know, if you're of a, a certain political persuasion, don't go to court in Washington or even New York. It, it, it's the Warren Commission all over again. It, 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 it's, it's over for you. Okay. You're not going to get a fair hearing. I'm sure there's other places, other jurisdictions. That it's the opposite. So when you get to cherry pick your court, you're you're essentially cherry picking your verdict. And then fourth, the signer agrees to pay the court costs for such a suit in the event he loses the suit. So it's it's pretty much the, determined you're going to lose, and you're also going to pay. <laughs> so these non-disclosure, and of course it's the CIA who's enforcing these. So it's not like you're going to get away with it. So if you worked with the committee in any way, shape, or form, uh, and you learned anything, you can't say anything. You can't tell anybody. People ask all the time, why didn't folks say something? Why, well, you know, make them a witness or make them somehow, br bring them into your, yeah, this is a tactic. If you're the CIA, it's in your interest. You find out somebody who knows something, bring them in as a contributor from and make them part of the committee's work and boy, make them sign one of these and they can't ever say anything. They might not even contribute anything to the committee's work, but by, by the fact that they were employed or hired or, you know, given a contract, whatever. Now they've signed this non-disclosure and they can't ever say anything. So that is one of the ways, one of the tricks that the government plays. And of course, they don't fight fair, right? Because we see all the time that the prosecutors will run in front of the cameras and they'll talk about the defendants or they'll post on social media about the defendants. But the defendant has a gag order or the defendant has one of these non-disclosure or somebody who worked on this committee has a non-disclosure. They can't respond. They can't say anything. So the government can say what they want. The CIA in this case can run around and say anything it wants. It can make up stuff. It can flat out lie to the American people. And the people that know they're lying can't respond. What an advantage. My goodness. All right. George Joannides. Rat fucker George. 
A little background about George. In 1951, he joined the CIA, and uh, he got affiliated pretty quick with the CIA's JM wave station down in Miami. If you've been paying attention, you know that the JM wave station was part of Operation Mongoose, and uh, it was led by Ted Shackley, and William Harvey worked down there. And I mean... It was where it was, it was like the epicenter of all things anti Castro. And he was the chief of the psychological warfare branch. And uh, so, in this role, he worked closely with an anti Castro organization, which was a CIA financed and CIA sponsored group called the Directorio Revolucionario Estudiantil, D R E. It's a militant right-wing, anti-communist, anti-Castro, anti-Kennedy group. You could kind of equate it with Alpha 66. It's pretty much the same. There were all these anti-Castro groups running around, splinter groups, and uh, the CIA had its hand in all of them. Anyway, this was a group that Lee Harvey Oswald was also in close contact with when he was in New Orleans in 1963 in August. In other words, Oswald had infiltrated the DRE chapter in New Orleans, the same group that this guy, George Joannides, worked with. Uh, and as such, they had uh, occasion to interact and work together and know each other. All right. This is in the 50s. So you have two people. They're both CIA they're both affiliated working with the same organization. They both are involved in this anti-Castro, anti-communist, and, and in Oswald's case, he's infiltrated it. George Joannides is actually working with it. So they're working together is my point in the 50s. In spite of this, you know, th this really puts Joannides in a precarious position if he's ever going to be a part of an investigation into Oswald or into the JFK assassination because he's involved with the group in the 50s. He's involved with the group that, A, is involved in the assassination plots against Castro and later is involved in the assassination plots against Kennedy. He's involved with them. He knows all the players, um, including Lee Harvey Oswald, whom... The government's blaming for the assassination. He knows all this. Nevertheless, he was appointed in 76 as the House Select Committee's liaison to the CIA. And as such, the CIA, of course, they know he's compromised, but that's the whole point. So they don't tell the committee about Joe and Edie's and, and what he did in the events that led up to 63. They don't tell the committee that he was part of JM Wave or that he was part of a, a psychological warfare branch of, of, of Jam Wave, or that he worked with the DRE, and as such, he was affiliated with a group that was trying to kill Castro, which is certainly going to be interesting to any investigation to the killing of Kennedy, and then found out that same organization later turned and became anti-Kennedy and was involved in the plot against Kennedy. He's involved with it, and they don't I, I, wanted, I wanted to say they don't think to tell the committee that. No, it has nothing to do with thinking. They intentionally don't tell the committee that and his association with Lee Harvey Oswald, which is a huge conflict of interest. Um, later, more information comes out, which leads critics to believe that Oswald was actually involved in the sheep dipping of Oswald. Uh, I'm sorry, that Joan Edes was actually involved in the sheep dipping of Oswald. <laughs> so, I mean, he's part of setting him up. And and now they got the fox who set up the the patsy, so to speak, and, and he's in the hen house helping to direct the investigation. He's the liaison between the CIA and the House, house Select Committee. And he's the guy that should be, he should be a witness. He shouldn't be involved in the House Select Committee as a... Uh, as an investigator or as a, on their side investigating, he should be in the witness chair, putting his hand up, swearing to tell the truth because they're, you know, they're looking around for people who know about Oswald's background. They're looking around for people who know about these anti-Castro Cubans. 
That's who they're going to end up pinning it on. They're looking for around for people who know if there's anyone in those anti-Castro Cubans groups that are trying to kill Kennedy. Well, he was part of an organization, a DRE, that was actively involved in anti-Kennedy plots, along with Alpha 66. And here he is working with the committee. All right, like I said, we aren't going to find out this until he dies. In 1990, Joe Anides dies. And that's when it's revealed, it's revealed that Joe Anides had been in contract with the DRE in 1963. And so... Investigators said, "Well, give us the, give us the files, CIA, about Joe and Edie's and his background." And of course, the CIA didn't want to give the files for obvious reasons. And the courts back them up. And in October 2006, Judge Richard Leon upheld the CIA's right to block disclosure of records about Joe and Edie's activities. Uh, researcher Rex Bradford pointed out, Judge Leon upheld the CIA's right to block disclosure of records about Joe and Edie's operational activities in August 63. That's precisely when Joe and Edie's agents in a Cuban exile student group had a series of encounters with accused assassin Lee Harvey Oswald and used U.S. government funds to call attention to his pro-Castro activities. That's the sheep dipping. So, Judge Richard Leon allows the CIA to stonewall after the fact efforts to find out what Joe and Edie's did or was involved in or had knowledge of in the lead up to the JFK assassination so that uh, investigator, uh, investigators and researchers can't learn the truth about how George Joe and Edie's was intentionally infiltrated into the House Select Committee to sabotage it. All right, so this is G. Robert Blakey, and, and he's furious. You know, I had heard interviews by Blakey, um, not in real time, but later, that had been taken prior to this knowledge. And he was still standing strong defending his work, defending the committee's work, defending their conclusions, standing strong said the CIA partnered with them. They had no knowledge that they had done anything to hamper the investigation. Everything was up and up. Everything was legit. I've also heard interviews post this revela these revelations. He's a different guy. It's a different answer. He's furious about it because he knows what happened. I mean, he's not an idiot. He doesn't have his head in the sand. He knows. He knows. So I'm going to read... His statement. I really think it's important. This is 2003, so it's 20 years ago. I, I heard him uh, just six months ago do a podcast, and uh, I heard him for he he talked for at length 90 minutes. He talked at length about all this. Boy, is he he's just he's you can just he's on a low boil. You can just. You can just tell when you listen to him. He's furious. He's still furious. He's an old man now. All right. These are all, this is Blakey's statement post-revelations about Joe and Edie's. Quote, I am no longer confident that the CIA cooperated with the committee. My reasons follow. I told you he's not going to hold any punches. Number one, the committee focused, on, uh, among other things, on number one, Oswald, Number two, New Orleans. Number three, the months before he went to Dallas. And number four, in particular, his attempt to infiltrate an anti-Castro group, the Directorio Revolucionario Estudiantel, or the DRE. These were crucial issues in the Warren Commission's investigation. They were crucial issues in the committee's investigation. The agency knew it full well in 1964. The agency knew it full well in 1976 to 79. Outrageously, the agency did not tell the Warren Commission or our committee that it had financial and other connections with the DRE, a group that Oswald had direct dealings with. He continues. What contemporaneous reporting is or was in the agency's DRE files 
we will never know. For the agency now says that no reporting is in the existing files. Are we to believe that its files were silent in 64 or during our investigation? I don't believe it for a minute. Money was involved. It had to be documented, period. End of story. The files and the agency agents connected to the DRE should have been made available to the commission and the committee. That the information in the files and the agents who could have supplemented it were not made available to the commission and the committee amounts to willful obstruction of justice. Obviously, too, it did not identify the agent who was in co its contact with the DRE at the crucial time that Oswald was in contact with it, George Joannides. He continues, during the relevant period, the committee's chief contact with the agency on a day-to-day -day basis was Scott Breckenridge. We sent researchers to the agency to request and read documents. The relationship between our young researchers, law students who came with me from Cornell, was anything but happy. Nevertheless, we were getting and reviewing documents. Breckenridge, however, suggested that he create a new point of contact person who might facilitate the process of obtaining and reviewing materials. He introduced me to Joannides, who he said he had arranged to bring out of retirement. Sound familiar? They always bring these guys. If you were with us during the Watergate, you know, E. Howard Hunt, Mr. Nixon, E. Howard Hunt, he's retired. He can help you with your plumbers. Mr. Nixon, James McCord, he's retired. He can help you with your bugs. Mr. Nixon, all these CIA guys that you need help with, with your special investigation unit out of the White House, they're all retirees, but they they have these special skills. And of course, Nixon hired them. Boy, the rest is history. Here it is again. He says, Joe Anides, he's bringing out of retirement to help us. He told me that he had experience in finding documents. Here we have special skills. He thought he would be of help to us. This sounds like uh, Richard Helms all over again, talking to President Nixon. Quote, I was not told of Joe Anides' background with the DRE, a focal point of the investigation. Had I known who he was, he would have been a witness who would have been interrogated under oath by the staff or by the committee. He would never have been acceptable as a point of contact with us to retrieve documents. In fact, I have now learned, as I note above, that Joe Anides was the point of contact between the agency and the DRE during the period Oswald was in contact with the DRE. This is unbelievable. You see why Blakey's mad. He continues, that the agency would put a material witness in as a filter between the committee and its quest for documents was a flat-out breach of the understanding the committee had with the agency that it would cooperate with the investigation. The committee's researchers immediately complained to me that Joe Anides was, in fact, not facilitating, but obstructing our obtaining of documents. That's why he's there. I contacted Breckenridge and Joe Anides. Their side of the story wrote off the complaints to the young age and attitude of my people. They were certainly right about one question. The committee's researchers did not trust the agency. Indeed, that is precisely why they were in their positions. We wanted to test the agency's integrity. I wrote off the complaints. I was wrong. The researchers were right. I now believe the process lacked integrity precisely because of Joannides. He continues, for these reasons, I no longer believe that we were able to conduct an appropriate investigation of the agency and its relationship to Oswald. Anything that the agency told us that incriminated in some fashion, the agency may well be reliable as far as it goes, but the truth could well be that it materially understates the matter. What the agency did not give us, none but those involved in the agency can know for sure. I do not believe any denial offered by the agency on any point. The law has long followed the rule that if a person lies to you on one point, you may reject all of his testimony. I now no longer believe anything the agency told the committee any further 
then I can obtain substantial corroboration for it from outside the agency for its veracity. We now know that the agency withheld from the Warren Commission the CIA mafia plots to kill Castro. Had the commission known of the plots, it would have followed a different path in its investigation. The agency unilaterally deprived the commission of a chance to obtain the full truth, which will now never be known. Significantly, the Warren Commission's conclusion that the agencies of the government cooperated with it is, in retrospect, not the truth. We also now know that the agency set up a process that could only have been designed to frustrate the ability of the committee, my committee in 1976 to 79, to obtain any information that might adversely affect the agency. He concludes this way. Many have told me that the culture of the agency is one of prevarication and dissimulation and that you cannot trust it or its people, period. End of story. I am now in that camp. That is the head of the House Select Committee in 2003 after he has learned that his entire investigation was compromised uh, by George Joannidis' presence because, as he says, Joannidis is actually a material witness. He should be in the witness chair. Instead, he is being sent by the CIA to act as a filter to prevent, obstruct, make difficult the job of getting documents, obtaining documents. And you saw what the researcher said, and, and Blakey admitted, he said, they were right, I was wrong. I believed the CIA in that moment. And up to about 1990, he believed them. Not anymore. And so... That is, you know, I, I I don't even remember what episode I introduced the word rat fucking to uh, into this, uh, this series, but uh, that's what their strategy is from start to finish. We've seen it in the Warren Commission. We've seen it in the Shaw trial. We've seen it in Watergate. Uh, we didn't see it in the church hearings. They lost control of the narrative there. But here we see it again in the House Select Committee. That is their primary strategy. Infiltrate, sabotage from within. And that's what they do. And of course, uh, they had their infiltrators in control over the Warren Commission, as Blakey noted. And it turns out they had their infiltrators in control over the House Select Committee as well. From the beginning, getting rid of Sprague, getting rid of Downing, infiltrating Richard Billings to help write the report, infiltrating George Joannides to control who gets what documents. In spite of that, the House Select Committee does come to the conclusion that JFK was killed. Well, well it says direct quote, JFK was probably assassinated as a result of a conspiracy. I don't believe the House Select Committee came to this conclusion on its own. I believe they were permitted to come to this conclusion by the CIA. This is a case of limited hangout. The new evidence is, in order to be credible, uh, they're going to have to admit uh, to a conspiracy. Obviously, they're going to continue to maintain that Oswald was involved. And by appointing Blakey, they're going to assure that the CIA escapes, the FBI escapes, and the blame is going to be pinned on Oswald, the Cubans, and the mafia. And so uh, if anyone you know, today says uh, that, the, uh, that the lone gunman theory is, if, if anyone defends that, they're defending something that's undefendable, and even the government doesn't defend it anymore. You know, the Warren report is defunct. It's been debunked the latest government investigation, as corrupted as it was, as conflicted as it was, as sabotaged as it was, all the things, it still has concluded that JFK was killed by, uh, as a result of a conspiracy. So don't let anyone diminish or you know, disparage your opinion that JFK was killed by a conspiracy. Don't, don't let them say to you, 
uh, oh, you're a conspiracy theorist. The government has concluded the same in, in 1979 as a result of the House Select Committee. Now, again, this is because the CIA dribbled some more truth out. Uh, the conspirators, uh, they don't have the conspirators right, uh, but they do have the conspiracy right. And, uh, but, you know, over time, the truth starts to dribble out and they have to move with it to stay relevant. And so, you know, not all conspiracies are theories. Some of them are true. Some of them happen. Most crimes are the result of conspiracy, which simply means two people are involved. That's all it means. And uh, I think it's been proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that more than two people were involved in the JFK assassination. A lot of people, a lot of moving parts, a lot of government agencies, a lot of private groups, a lot of folks. So uh, that is the conclusion of the House Select Committee. And so, as you know, we always finish or conclude each investigation with the body count. So tomorrow, and, and the body count in the House Select Committee period is pretty extensive. And I don't make any claims to have all the names or, or anything, but I have included a, quite a list. And so it will take two days. So tomorrow, just Thursday, and then fr Friday, we will do the body count from the House Select Committee. It's, it's a pretty extensive list. Some pretty big names, pretty important people on that list. So that will be the agenda going forward the next two days. And, uh, and then uh, Saturday, I will be out of town and we will be heading out, uh, heading south with the grandkids to go to the Gulf for spring break. So I will not be doing any episodes until again, until April 1st, April fool's day, believe it or not, uh, which is that following Monday when we, we return and begin school again. So we will, this is, this will be a good breaking off point. We will conclude investigation number five today. We'll do the, do the two days of dead, uh, the body counts tomorrow on Friday, and then begin my spring break and come back on April 1st and begin investigation number six. Just a little heads up on what's coming down the pike. Well, that's it for today. I hope everybody enjoyed that. And uh, check out my website, sphistory.com. Uh, subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell. Find out when new content drops and then hit the thumbs up and feel free to comment. I, I do enjoy checking out the comments and we do learn from each other. And uh, so until next time, everybody have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye.